Thank you so much for listening to Blue Sky Radio. My name is Yeni. This is at CKMS Radio Waterloo in Kitchener and Waterloo. You can listen to us at 102.7 FM. Uh, you can also find us online at radiowaterloo.ca. Uh, and currently we're also on Facebook on the Blue Sky Radio page. Today with me is equine trainer Randy Bird. And uh, Randy Bird is a really extraordinary human being who has a special hand with horses. He's been involved with uh, Albert Botha in uh, two documentaries so far, uh, Quiet Man, Quiet Horse, as well as Saving the Mustang, North America's Horse on the Brink. So I really want to welcome uh, Randy today on to, onto the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Randy. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, would you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes, uh, as Jenny said, my name is Randy Bird, and I am a horse trainer. And we have a, along with my wife and, and daughters, we run a facility in Harwood called Randy Bird Equine Education. Harwood's a small town; it, it's about 90 miles east of Toronto, and we're 15 miles north of Covert, right off the 401. And we have been here for a lot of years, and, and uh, we run what we call an equine education business, and my philosophy is that it's uh, educating a horse is similar to educating a person. It, it, it's a step-by-step -step procedure, and, and the, the, the more rock solid that is, the better the product will be. We deal with, with uh, all, all breeds. Over the years, we've done all breeds for both riding and driving. And we've, I'm pleased to say, have a client base from, we've done horses from Prince Edward Island, California. All uh, wonderful breeds that, uh, on our website, if, if you care to look at that, you'll see some of the, the breeds from coaching horses to event horses, just a little bit of everything. So that's pretty much who we are and what we do. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, extraordinary that you're working with all breeds. That's uh, definitely a unique thing. A lot of people focus on either just a few or maybe even just one breed of horses. So that's great. Um, and congratulations to being uh, you guys. Your documentary was entered and is screening at uh, this year's Equus Film Festival, uh, Saving the Mustang. So congratulations. That, that must feel pretty amazing. Yes. Thank you. It is very amazing. We're on, I feel quite honored and pleased that being a Canadian production it was accepted and, and uh, I give full credit to, to Albert both and his team I mean, Albert as I say is a world class filmmaker and mm -hmm. without him there, there wouldn't be this film uh, what was your own role in the in the documentary yes uh, my role was to um, uh Back in 2005, the, the uh, U.S. government had passed a bill to Congress that uh, any uh, wild Mustang or burrow could be sold. Up until that point, they had been protected for 35 years. And from that, at that point, um, any, any horse over the age of 10 could be sold. Well, uh, if, if there's no question what they would be sold for. These were totally wild, untrained horses. There's no wild horses on the planet. They run wild all their lives on a rough open country and uh, Albert had contacted me uh, apparently someone had contacted him and were wondering if we would help raise awareness to the plight of these these older horses these mustangs as a lot of the American people didn't even know that this had taken place so anyhow um, he contacted me and, and the idea was to take one of these older horses 10 or older and try and train it to do something so it would prove to the rest of the world that these older horses could have a purpose, a purpose, a useful life. So uh, I, I did commit to it. I said to Albert, you know, that, that it would do it. And fortunately, back in, in, I think it was 1990 or 9, I had had experience with Mustangs from Michigan. And at that point, there was a an adoption program, the, the BLM, the Real Land Management in the States, they had an adoption program whereby any they, they would round up all the young Mustangs and wild burros from one to two years old, and they would have a, a lottery system, and they would go to different locations in the States, and uh, you could put your name in to this lottery, and provided you passed the specifications, your property pass inspection, you could... Uh, 
get one of these Mustangs, and you had to be an American citizen. You could get one of these young Mustangs. So I had some clients from Michigan had gotten some of these young horses, and they were two and three and four when they came here. They had been handled, and but they'd been spoiled. And anyhow, that was my first introduction to the Mustangs. And I started to realize, realize right then they were a, definitely a different and remarkable breed. But the real eye-opener came for me. Um, I got a little mare, a seven-year-old mare from a, again, from a, a client in Michigan. She had just come in from being caught in Colorado several weeks before. And when she arrived here, I got a really good picture of what a really, truly wild horse was. Um, she, she had loaded her the night before in Michigan just so she could get her on a trailer. And when she came here, she was standing in the in the stock trailer, shivering. We finally got her, were able to get her off and into a stall, drive her into a stall. And from there on out for the next three or four weeks, the minute you opened that stall door, she would just turn her head to the corner, drop her head, and kick both feet right at you. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I realized right then and there, I had to come up with a whole new program. Uh, this was unlike any other horse that I'd had. And not only, it wasn't just a matter of training her, it was to keep her safe and sound while I was doing it. So somewhere I have a diary on her, and anyhow, I had some special equipment to catch her and, and work through it, and in the end, we did get her riding, and she was just the sweetest little thing. And I never ever forgot her, so that was, uh, as I say, was my first introduction to a real, totally wild horse. So when Albert called me that night, we had done the, the film Quiet Man, Quiet Horse. And in Quiet Man, Quiet Horse, we do a lot of tough problem horses, well, driving, riding, and uh, as I say, I'll feature on our website, there are pictures of horses rearing. That was just kind of a natural thing with, with the types of horses we do. We did all breeds, big 17-hand crossbreds, you know, warm bloods, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that we hadn't seen tough horses. So when Albert called me and I said, Albert, I said, you know, these are tough horses. He said, Randy, oh, you've done lots of tough horses. I said, not like these. These are wild horses. And I don't think until we got to Wyoming, they really had any concept of what we were dealing with. So as I say, uh, my biggest concern, I walked in it with my eyes wide open. And I think the three reasons I decided to do it, number one, at that point, uh, Canada and U.S., there was a mad cow dispute going on, and I thought, you know, it isn't very often that the Americans come to the Canadians for help, or for, as we had been asked to do with these, so that was one reason. The second reason was to maybe save these horses, and the third reason was I knew beyond any doubt it would be a rock-solid test of my, of my skill and my training methods. For those three reasons, I signed on. That's incredible. It really is amazing what you did, and it's really nice to be able to talk to somebody who has actually gone and done what you have, uh, what you took on. And uh, you are on Facebook Live as well right now. Are you looking at the photo that we're sharing here? Uh, that was a fellow by the name of John McLaren. They were actually his horses we were riding. Okay. And uh, we would, we were, we, that was actually, we, we were doing a, a couple of chase scenes there. And is that late in the evening? It looks like, like, it's, like, yeah, it looks like it's going on the evening, yeah. Yeah, it'd be a sunset shot. We had just finished the shooting that day, and Albert had wanted to get some sunset shots there, so that's why we were there, yes. So that fellow was John McLaren. It's amazing. I mean, when you think about all of this land that's out there, and the horses that are on it, and all of the struggle that's still happening with the... Uh, cattle industry and mining industry and all of the stuff that's happening and oh, for sure. right so thank you for all of the work that you've done and it, it was interesting that photo too we were at 7500 feet that was a place called flaming gorge and albert we've been done doing a shoot down the road we've we done chasing down the road father and albert had gone up ahead to scout to see if there were any more wild horses and he came flying back and he said there's a herd down here in the box canyon up the road not too far so crew horse everything reloaded we rushed up there and it was a place called Flaming Gorge. It was kind of a tourist attraction you could pull over. And down in this canyon were a, a herd of wild horses. So anyhow, the crew set up there, and it was so steep going down, and we had to go around the other side of the mountain and come down at them. And I must say, that's the most dangerous ride I've ever had in 
my life. It, oh. uh, we, we did get down in there, and then getting getting down, we had to get back out. But uh, it, it was, you know, it was horrific as it seemed. It was wonderful to to get it done and and have the photos and and the footage to you know to go along with it. It is spectacular country there, and and as you can see by the by the, that shot there in the evening. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, something about uh, bringing back Mustangs as well to Canada. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. We brought back um, we brought back five geldings and three mares, and the five geldings came to my facility here in Harwood, to our facility here in Harwood. The three mares went to a place probably 15 miles away. Uh, it was an inn and spa called St. Anne's. They had some property there that Albert had secured for, um, to, to bring the wild horses to, to bring the Mustangs back to. Now, here, I had built an area for them. I, I had built a seven foot high fence. Mm -hmm. And four feet up the fence, I had put a, a 12 inch bumper board. It just in case. Uh, uh, my thought was if they ever got out, you'd have to use an ice to get them. I mean, you would never get them back. These horses were, they're coming right from the, from the government yards there. So anyhow, the three mares, they stayed at St. Anne's and the five geldings came here. Oh, wow. So do you want to talk a bit about those horses that you brought, that you had? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, in the wild, the Mustangs in the wild, they have a comfort zone. I know, so we were shooting them. But, you know, at, 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 say, 500 yards, they would graze, and they watch you, but they didn't really care. But all of a sudden, when you got to 300 yards, they were gone. They had their comfort zone, and I realized that immediately just from shooting. So I realized uh, uh, at home I had to provide a comfort zone for them. Well, we've got a small place of 15 acres, and there's a lot of traffic. There's roads going by. It's, it's, you know, and anyhow, I realized that I had to somehow have a, a comfort zone for them. So, I have a, a loafing shed and a and a paddock with a, uh, our teaching well that feeds a bath out for good, good, clear, cold water, fresh water for them. And I thought that is going to have to be their their comfort zone. And it was far enough away from the stable in the parking lot that. You know, because they saw everything. You have to, you know, it's hard to imagine how wild these horses were and what a culture shock it was to them. Yeah. So anyhow, the one thing I hadn't really counted on was the amount of press and people that would come to see these horses. There was, there was five or six TV stations, newspapers, and just... Um, just people coming in, like, um, you know, 4-H groups and things, that the traffic was unreal the first couple of years. It was nothing for me to come home on a Sunday afternoon and see two or three cars in the yard looking at the horses. Mm -hmm. Well, and, I re and the one thing about a horse, he's a creature habit, and the Mustang's no different. And I had to daily, just week by week, condition these horses to, number one, get used to people, get used to the film crew, like the TV crews coming in and things. And it was amazing how how they did respond, but it was step by step, very meticulous. And I still, at that point, had to select the one horse that I was going to start to train. And the biggest worry was, was to be able to move these horses carefully and not get them hurt or, or, or or badly, badly, you know, possibly get, get them killed. Like, I mean, they were wild horses and they spooked at anything. And I had to devise a chute and a, and a system to handle them, which in time and, and just with careful planning and just step by step, we did get done. And the one horse I, I decided that, that I would, would train was a horse, and I named them all after Wyoming Towns. And uh, Casper was a black gelding, and he was 14, too, and I decided... He was the only one in the first week he would come up and take Kay out of my hands, which was pretty incredible. And from then on, Casper and I, we, we kind of had a bond. And he just had a wonderful way about him. And I realized that, I mean, he was a wild horse, there was no question about it. You didn't go and touch him in the back or anything like that. He's the one that I started with. And it, it just, it, it took about a year. And finally, um, I think I, there, I, there's a picture of him in there uh, driving. Yep. And that is actually on the film. And it, and it was, it, I worked all winter on him, and that winter I moved him into the stable. 
I had to get him inside. It was cold, and and never in his life had he been anywhere like that. I, I had different people say to me, he will destroy your barn. I said, I don't think so. I said, I think he's going to like it. By then, he'd started to mellow a bit. And sure enough, we moved him inside for the winter, and it was nothing for him to see, you know, cameras in his eye, lights and things. And that winter was March, I think. We, we, were, we were getting ready. Uh, Phil Turner, the fellow was working with me at the time, we just took our time with him and got him, you know, school of the gear and everything and I think it was in March we, we actually got him hooked and it was amazing because it was a, a just a miserable day it was about six inches of snow on the track and we finally got him going and he just picked up the most beautiful trot and trod around there like he'd done it all his life yeah it was pretty incredible wow sounds like it he was very lucky to meet somebody like yourself because I mean to, historically, wild horses have kind of been broken. I mean, people talk about breaking horses, and here you are talking about gentling and starting. Like, that's really... Uh, well, as I say, that the thing that, 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 you, that these horses, that they, they would destroy themselves. They don't get it. You don't tie them up. I mean, they, they would just... In time, with proper schooling in the chute, I was able to do that. I had halters on them very carefully, but... <laughs> They're, you just picture wild zoo animals. That's what they are. They, there's no wilder horse on the planet. When they come in, and they're, they'll, they'll fight to their death for their freedom. I mean, they just don't know anything else. But in the end, they still are a horse. They respond to number one, food was a big motivator. And just the quiet, gentle handling. And, you know, it, it, it definitely worked. And, and uh, so Casper, you know, was maybe one of the oldest Mustangs ever put in harness. Yeah. I know when I was in Rock Springs, I said to the foreman, the yard foreman, I said, Luke, how, you know, uh, how old, how, how, you know, how, how old have you done any of these pieces? I would not touch one over the age of two. They were using a couple of them in the yards they were riding there, but they'd been young horses, so they'd gotten any yearlings and, and, and handled them. And uh, now our, our second and third generation there, Jackson, I believe I sent you photos of him, uh, totally different. I mean, he was wild when he came in here, but at least they had been born in our world. They'd seen, you know, traffic. They'd seen so much more than these, these fellows, the older ones, the originals had. And the original ones, when they came, I had to teach them what a grain pail was. They didn't know anything. And food, as I say, was a huge motivator, and just step by step, and, and they're so smart. And the one thing I, I really found about them, they're, they're so much more appreciative of everything than our horses. Our horses don't have to think. Everything's provided for them. Where these, these fellows, all their life, they've had to survive. They've had to, you know, be, to be smart and, and resilient. And, and uh, it definitely shows us. They are a remarkable breed. Hmm. It is really extraordinary. Yeah, we're still, uh, I'm showing the pictures here, we're scrolling along, and it's still the Wyoming ones, but I believe one of the next ones will be uh, when we're actually come a little further. Let's see here. Okay. Um, but we can talk about uh, what was Saving the Mustang days about? Okay, it, it was uh, in 2010, we finally had Saving the Mustang finished. It was, it was all done. And uh, thanks to Albert, it was took about five years to, to get the um, to get the funding, get everything in place. And Albert was just tenacious enough to, to hold on, and, and he, he managed to get this all done with a company in front of Coast Stornoway Productions. So it was time to release Saving the Mustangs. And uh, at that time, too, um, I had uh, some uh, good friends and clients, and one of our sponsors is a company called World Class Carriages of the Southern Pines, North Carolina. And all our training is done here on marathon vehicles. And I remember I called my good friend Bob Cook down there, and I said, Bob, can you call the company and see if they'll make a carriage and call it the Mustang? And so he sent me a, or called me back a couple of days. He said they're going to do it. So he sent me up a prototype, and, and uh, I sort of styled it after one of our other carriages. And it was about three or four months or more. God, they sent me the first one. And I was just waiting to get a Mustang horse on that carriage. So it just so happened in 2010, our second generation Mustang, Cody, which was a really nice little red roan fellow, he was the one that I had started training that that spring to get ready for for the, the use in the film. We were still shooting, finishing up the film then. And so we decided we're going to have a screening here at, at the farm. And 
I decided that uh, we, we were using Cody as well, and we did that demonstration that day, and uh, the film was playing, and it's just really, really a fun weekend. And anyhow, that was the first time I got to put a Mustang on a Mustang. <laughs> That's incredible. So, so what we did then at the time, I, I partnered up with Easter Seals. I'd done a couple of shows. I always did a clinic here in the summer, just a training clinic. And a few years before, I'd started to I partnered up with Easter Seals, and the, the clinic proceeds went to them. So I decided that that year in 2010, I said, Albert, could we do a Mustang Festival? You know, feature the film and you know let people see the horses. And so we had uh, three Mustang Festivals, I guess. So yeah, it was fun. It was just really a nice way people could come and see the horses and. So that's what that was all about. That sounds really amazing. Yeah, uh, Cac Betts, who also sent a picture from, uh, I believe uh, one of your horses was pregnant, and uh, the picture will show on the screen here in a minute, but okay. um, she was at one of your uh, events, and she was oh. also wondering if you're planning to do any more of those. Uh, yes, we haven't done any Mustang festivals for years. It, it was a lot of work, and, and, and it was just, it seemed tougher and tougher to get a crowd, but uh, many people still ask me about the horses. They still come and see them, and, and uh, so no, I don't have any plans in the immediate future. That's okay. It might happen. It may not happen, but uh, sure. we still have some hope about it, I think. Well, I mean, you never say never, do you? Eh? Right. Uh, do you have any other projects on the horizon with Albert? No, uh, not not yet. But I tell you, any, if he, anything he was had asked me, I'd certainly consider because they were he and and his wife Meg were, were just phenomenal to work with. Albert, as I say, is a is a superb filmmaker. He's a brilliant photographer, and his wife Meg is an amazing graphic designer. And all of our posters and literature, it's just. It's just so beautifully done, and I give it the credit to them. They they were just it was really really fortunate for me when when I teamed up with them. Hmm. Well, that brings me to the question about uh, Quiet Man, Quiet Horse. Could you tell us a bit more about that? And can yeah. can the are these documentaries available to uh, watch? Uh, Quiet Man, Quiet Horse. We still and I, I'm working on now getting some some copies that I can that, that I can just let out. Um, the, the Saving the Mustang one, as of yet, is not. But The Quiet Man, Quiet Horse was, the, that was my first introduction to Albert, actually. It was a cold February day and night, and I think it was 2004. I got a call, and this fellow said, oh, my name's Albert Botha, and, and I'm a filmmaker, and we're, we're wondering maybe we're doing a, a, a story uh, with you. I said, oh, sure. So anyhow, we had a couple of meetings then, and our first, my horse show was in July that year, and that was the first day of shooting. And that was when I realized just how, how you know, meticulous Albert was, and his crew were fabulous. They, we, we shot for the two, two days of the show, and, and the Quiet Man, Quiet Horse, it's sort of an introductory our biography. It's a bit of a training feature as well as a, a biography, who we are, what we do, and it's, it's just got some... There's a beautiful feature uh, from Virginia. I had done some coaching horses down there for some very influential clients. And the one year there they had a, it was the biggest coaching meet in 100 years in the U.S. And they had 30, I think it was 31 foreign hand and coaches come to Middleburg, Virginia. And we got invited down. You know, I got invited down, Joanne and my wife and I got invited down to to spend the weekend at this festival, this coaching festival. So anyhow, I called ahead to this uh, Frolic Weymouth, who was the, the organizer of it all, the chairman. We had done some horses for Frolic. And I said, Frolic, can we possibly bring the film crew? And we're doing this film, finishing up the film, and get some footage. And, and uh, his exact words are, yeah, he said, you come on down, I'll lie like hell for you. <laughs> and so we went down, and uh, the crew, we went down. And anyhow, um, it, it was just like something from a hundred years ago. All these beautiful road coaches and horses, and all in the original livery, the grooms, and and the one uh, the one place we stopped for at noon uh, was actually one of the original uh, properties they used on Gone with the Wind. Mm. And we drove up this long tree line lane and every coach pulled up to the big mansion and they had the big columns out front. The owners, they'd come and watch, that coach would move on. And we they had lunch there and, and then uh, 
I think we finished on Sunday. We started shooting down there on a Saturday morning, and we, and we finished on the Sunday. There's some beautiful footage of that particular event on Quiet Man, Quiet Horse. There's client interviews of horses that have run away and have hurt people, and it, again, so, some great photography. You know, it's just really uh, I'm, Quiet Man, Quiet Horse is, is a very special film for me. Hmm, it sounds like it. Uh, we just have up on the screen uh, one of the photos that you had sent, and there looks like there's a bit of a fire in the field, and you got the horse walking by in the carriage. Okay, that that's the, uh, that, that's our third generation Mustang called Jackson, and he's a beautiful blue roan. And Jackson came here. It was the 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 2010 year when we were doing the film. He came here. Albert had called me, and I think it was late. November, and he said, Randy, we've got two young stallions here, we need to geld, and I've got nowhere to do it, and I had to shoot here. He said, can we use the shoot? And I said, sure. I said, you can use the shoot if you can get them here. So, let me know if you need a hand. So, anyhow, Albert rolled in with them on the trailer, and he, he said he had the tranquilizer gun to tranquilize them with, so he did get them on. We got them unloaded and, and got them into the shoot, and Jackson, this fellow here, he looked like a punk rocker. He had never had a hand on him in his life. Hmm. And I could see he had burrs about six inches high in his mane, and I could see the whites of his eyes. He, the tranquilizer starting to wear off. So yeah, I had him about three or four days. Winter was coming on, it was getting cold, and I knew I would have to get him in. So we did get them gelded successfully, that went well. And then um, I was trying to get him just quiet enough that I could lead him to get him in the stable. And uh, I remember it, it was, about four, day, four or five days after he got here, and I'd have him around Jared and was just kind of get him handled a bit. And Cody, the second generation one, who was already done, we'd used him in the film, he was in one yard and Jackson was in the other. And I had a, a crew from Global here doing a, a feature on them, and we went over to Cody. He was perfectly trained. I could crack a stock up around him and flick it at him. He'd walk right up to me. And we went over to Jackson's yard. I said, this guy just come in. He's not, not nearly as, 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 you know, as tall of us as Cody was. But it was amazing because two days later, I walked out there, and I cracked a stock whip, and I just gently flicked it at him. He walked right over and put his head right in my chest. Oh, wow. and and never have I had that ever done before. And I remember calling Albert and I said, you need to see this. And I knew right then that he would be a friend for life as long as I never, ever, you know, um, let him down. He wouldn't let me down, and he never has. He's just everything I could have ever wanted in the horse. And that's him. We were doing a mail run that day. We have a, uh, we live in a small town here, and I pick the mail up every day with horses. And uh, we're on the road every day. They, that's one of the things that's, that, that has sold our work right to North America is, is the traffic work we do. It's not fun and, and it's dangerous, but it's, it's you know, when they can do that, a lot of the coaching horses and the pleasure horses, everyone needs that. They need them safe in traffic. So that was a, I had a client here one day. She was coming just to, some people will come in and have a look and meet me and decide whether they want to send her horse or not. And I just took her that day. We were on a mail run. And we just broke over the hill, and I saw a smoke, and I said, Jeez, I don't want to know what this is. Well, we broke over the hill, and there's a grass fire. And she was horrified. She said, what do we do now? I said, I watched Jackson. And he was pretty good, and, and he just walked down by all that smoke and fire, and that's just the kind of horse he is. So, yeah, that, that Jackson's our third generation. Wow, that's incredible. He must really trust you. He definitely, there's no question about that. He definitely does. And I, I think the Mustangs, I remember Luke down there, the foreman in the yard, I, he said to me, you know, that they, they will get to try, like, you know, they get to rely on you. Well, Jackson really did with me. He would do anything for me, and it took a while to get him sort of weaned on everyone else, and now he is. It doesn't seem to matter who harnesses him, and, but boy, he's still, if he gets in trouble, and I'm out doing anything with him. It's amazing when I can talk to him into just by quietly you know, reassuring him and just really, really a wonderful, kind, smart little horse. Hmm. Well, sounds really amazing. Um, we also have a question here about if you would ever consider doing a documentary on the plight of the Albertan and the BC wild horses. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because when, um, uh, before we, uh, well, I guess we just got back to Wyoming and there was a story about our Mustangs on the front page of the old mail. 
and then after that I got phone calls, I got this, I got threats, I got everything, you know. And one of them, it was kind of a, a little bit of a, an unsavory letter came from, or an email came from someone in BC, and why would I bother doing the, the American Mustangs? I should be helping the Canadian wild horses. Well, at that point, no one had ever asked me, and, and to me, you know, it doesn't matter to me which side of the border they're on. I mean, a horse is a horse, and, yeah. and they all... So uh, would I? I mean, I I don't know. I, I have to say, I, you never say never. i just never been approached to, so... Fair enough. That's fair enough, and you're right. A horse is a horse, and I mean, wild horses, uh, whether in Canada or in the U.S., they all need uh, advocacy. Right. And what's happening? I mean, it's going to take a lot of people to to save them. And it's really nice that you guys uh, chose to work with older horses too, the ones that you brought back. Well, that's the thing. You see, um, the younger ones, yes, there is. They're they're totally different than than these little fellows that that have never seen anything. Yeah. And. You know, uh, there I've got t uh, two of my originals left. I've got Casey and Cheyenne. There's photos of them there. They're 27 now, and they don't look any different than they did when we got them. They're, they're just, you know, they're just so tough and resilient. And another thing, too, that at the time, um, this was kind of historical project as well because these are the first American Mustangs that ever been allowed over the border. And up until that point, you had to be an American to own one. Mm -hmm. And this was a pilot project. The American government and the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, decided they would, would do just to try and, and, as I say, to prove that there was a, uh, these horse, older horses could have a useful life and to, may, to maybe get some more of them adopted out. Mm -hmm. So these were definitely the first that legally came across the border for sure. It's going, to be, it's going to be really uh, interesting and exciting to see how Saving the Mustang will do because uh, it's really timely when you guys made it and now it is st still just as relevant. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. And you know, the, the Saving the Mustang, um, it's, I, I, people say to me, What's your, what are your thoughts on it? And really, you know, I see it has the rancher's perspective, it's got the BLM's perspective, it's got the animal rights and I honestly not sure there's an answer. It, it's you know there's there's it's the same as, as in a lot of places. There's animal human conflict, and there's you know the, the oil companies here they're moving in on the Mustangs graze, and, and the ranchers. They, uh, the one rancher they interview he says a few are all right, but he said they they just starve, they die, they, they no water, you know they. And that's what the BLM said. Mother Nature will sort them out. They have the animal rights are saying, well, you know, let Mother Nature sort them out. And the BLM, the one fellow, he said that they will. Here she will. And it, it's a cruel and horrific death. They, they'll show pictures of the skeletons of them. So I, I honestly don't know. All I know is that we we try to do our part. And mm -hmm. we've got some here, some here that have, are, have had a great life since they got here. Well, I mean, maybe it's just uh, so many different angles that people can take, and it takes many people to do something. And I mean, making a documentary is definitely one way to create a lot of awareness. And it is nice that I can't wait to watch the documentary myself. I know that you guys okay. went out to BC as well to First Nations people, and uh, that's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I wasn't on that part of Albert and, the, and some of the other crew went there, but yeah, exactly, you've got, uh, I think they've just done a really super job, they've got, like, you know, they gave the animal rights their say, they gave the ranchers their say, you know, and our perspective, and, and uh, I just didn't get into politics, but I mean, I, I, the one thing is, if we could save these horses, and I think we definitely slowed the, we, we definitely slowed the sale down, because um, the, 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 some of the horses that, that that ours came up with, they got dropped off in Iowa at a plant. They, they, that was the end of them. And then it was shortly after that that um, there was 42, there's a, 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 someone in, in uh, South Dakota, 42 of these older horses got slaughtered. Mm -hmm. And then that, that really, that's when our story went in the Globe Mail, that really kicked the door wide open. And then the, the sale was banned. And I'm not sure just yet what, 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 what the, the status of it is, but that point so we definitely you know help for a halt for that for sure yeah all right well let's talk a little bit about what you do at randy bird equine education okay yeah here as i say we do riding and driving all breeds and we um we've rehabilitated a lot of horses and we've done horses that have run away and and 
uh, I'm, uh, I'm a firm believer, but my philosophy is that I want everyone safe and happy. I love horses, but I love mankind more. My first obligation are to my clients and the people that will be handling these horses. And I do not keep a horse just to get a board bill. If I don't feel good about the horse, it might be three days, it might be three weeks, I will call the people. And I think that's one of the things that's built our business <clears throat> for years, as I say, right over from North America. And we take a lot of pride in our work, and and I just really enjoy seeing a problem. Well, I've got a couple here right now that were, you know, they, they weren't dangerous horses, but they were problem horses for the people. They were, you know, they were they just weren't really nice riding horses. Well, you know, here they're, they're, they'll go home as nice pleasure horses, nice horses that people can, can enjoy. I always say if, if your horse is good, if you've had a good rider drive one day, you'll find every reason to do it the next day. And if you haven't, you'll find every excuse not to. It has to be fun, safe, and enjoyable, and we do our best to make it that that way for people. Mm -hmm. And you did mention your location. You were, uh, can you could you go over that again? Where are you actually located? Yeah, we're we're uh, located. We're 15 miles north of the town of Coburg, and Coburg is right on the 401. We're actually situated quite nicely. We're about two and a half hours from the the, uh, the U.S. border at uh, you know, uh, Thousand Islands, and the Windsor border, or uh, below border of Sarnia. So over the years, we've had clients come from both directions, from the states or whatever. And uh, so uh, it, we're used to get to good, good roads. And the uh, directions are on our website. Our website's randybird.ca, uh, just in case you know anyone's interested. But um, yes, uh, as I say, we 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 just try. And my whole philosophy is quiet man, quiet horse. That's how that that film. That's how we got the title for that film. And I recently got my method I, I, from a, a, an old Australian trainer called J.D. Wilton. And the reason I chose it, I, I just, it just made sense. His philosophy was the horse and his education. And that's why I decided that we would call our organization Randy Bird Equine Education. And that's exactly what it is. I don't break horses, I educate them. Hmm. That's amazing. So then, what made you start this line of work? How did you get involved with horses? I never remember a time in my life when I didn't love horses. I raced my first pony when I was 10 on the fair. I, I rode and I, I started training standard breads at a farm up the lake from me when I was 14. I drove my first race when I was 17. And I was riding and driving. I, I never ever zeroed in on a breed or I thought, geez, why not do it all? So, and I never quit doing it. And then it was actually my trip to, I flew to Australia you know, with a load of horses in 1987. And that was where I learned, started to get the basis of this method. And that's what really changed my life in the horse business. What it was learning this technique and I, what I call Canadianized it to our climate, to our people, and without that, I would, uh, I would not be where I am today in the horse business for sure. Wow. Yeah, I've spent some time on your website, and it's uh, really extraordinary, really extraordinary. Wow. It's really nice to speak with somebody and to know that, you know, you're working at it from, from the right end of it. Uh, there's way too much abuse happening and way too much power over horses and animals in general, but it's right. refreshing to uh, hear you speak. So then, uh, how hard and time-consuming, we kind of touched on it already, but the, the difference between gentling a Mustang uh, compared to the domestic horses. Okay, now, now the original wild Mustangs, the old ones, it, it was day and night the difference. You know, and as I said before, the biggest trick with them was that I had people, hundreds of people coming to her all the time. A lot of these people became on a first name basis with those horses. They knew Cheyenne, they knew Cody, they knew, or Casey, they knew. And I knew that all of a sudden if they showed up and Casey was missing, you know, because he'd been hurt or something. And that was the thing, it, it, was, it was just a matter of, that's why I say the shoots and the proper system to handling them, it took a long time. Yeah. You know, it's there's no question, and they're dangerous horses at any time. Like you know, they they were just they could kick and strike just like lightning. But again, they're horses, and they were you know they're creature of habit. And as I say, food was a big motivator, and it was understanding and planning ahead, Have, having a game plan every day for the next day, and watching the horses. They're incredibly smart. 
And I can remember Casper did the gelding that I'd done. We, um, he was 14, we did him, and I said, when, when he's done this, I, I, I won't do another thing with him. He deserves his peace. He just deserves a nice, quiet life. And he never quit being my friend. And I could walk out into the paddock a year later. I used to use him at our Mustang festivals, bring the boys all in. I could crack a whip over his, their stock whip over his head, and he'd stand there. He hadn't had it since the year before, but he just had that kind of trust in me, and I'd go up, and, and uh, I never played around with back end or speed or whatever, I'd just say, come on, and he'd put his head over my shoulder, and he never, ever lost that. So they, they are incredibly intelligent horses, for sure. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, you until you've seen wild horses like this, you cannot fathom, you know, yeah. just, just what they're like. Yeah, and, and I think the quiet man, quiet horse. When you see these these horses at the government yard, you, you see them, you know, throwing themselves against the fence in these all steel uh, uh, yards and things. And you realize then what? And I remember we were bringing they would bring thirty five geldings out of the chute. We're bringing them in out of the, the pens to bring them into the chute for selection to pick the ones we wanted. And they had to come up the chute. There was a man on horseback behind them, and they had to make a slight corner as a gate there. And the yard foreman, the crew, film crew, they were set up there, and they had cameras there. And he said, I'm going to tell you right now, he said, you fellows there with those cameras, if they hit that gate, you're gone. They'll flatten it. Well, 35 horses came down that chute, and I'll never forget. The ground just shook. They would have flattened anything in their path. These horses were that wild. And I actually saw one. He almost got over a seven-foot gate there, and he caught his back on the top of the of uh, uh, the the shoot, or, or he would he would have gotten over a seven foot gate. Wow, that's, that's what these horses were like. And I think the film quite mag, or excuse me, um, saving the Mustang. There will be shots of these horses in the yard, and and they were just and and until you've seen and handled them, you can't comprehend, you know, how wild these horses are. I believe you. Um, then if somebody is interested in working with, if, if somebody is interested in you working with their horse, how would they contact you? Uh, just, um, you know, our website, or, or my email is arbortereagle.ca. And another uh, person I really like to mention, that, 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 you mentioned our website and things. Uh, we have a lady by the name of Katie Woodward. Katie's a good friend, and she lives in a little town called Min, and Katie does all her Facebook and website. And so she's responsible for the layout, and we just send her the pictures. And so uh, Katie, you know, Facebook quite often sent people email Katie, and she'll get back to me on it. So not a problem. Like, it's very easy to find. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, I also am supposed to give you uh, Jar's warm regard. He know the, oh, he knows that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, he says you're an awesome guy. and Oh, good for Jar. Yeah, we're all sharing all this information. I mean, we're a little group. I belong to a Canadian Wild Horses uh, advocacy group with Cat Be Cat Betts and Christine Gallant, and we just okay. And then I started this radio show to kind of increase awareness and get people's voices out, like your own. Uh, congratulations! That's a wonderful thing you've done. Yeah, well, we all love horses, and together we can move mountains. That's sort of the idea. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's, it's, it's like our us with the Mustangs. It was a mountain, but it's better to try, and I'm just so pleased. that. And, and I think the film, number one, it was, it was five long years to get the film, the Saving the Mustang film. And I'm just so pleased now that, it, that it's getting recognized for Albert's sake. I mean, if anyone deserves Albert does, and, and as I say, I'm just so thrilled and honored for Albert as much as any of us. Mm-hmm. Well, it is just as relevant now as it ever was, and, you know... Oh, for sure. I mean, it, it, exactly. Everything's the same. I mean, these horses... At that time, there was about 14,000 government yards. I think there was eight government yards around the states. We got ours from Rock Springs. And, you know, there there's there 14,000 of them. Plus, they had, they're had doing gathers regularly. And it, it's, you know, it's a big problem. Like, it's... Yeah. I know, it's a really big one, because now the horses, I think there's something like 50,000 horses sitting in the yards now. Oh, it could be, it could be. Um, yeah, it's just, and I remember I was doing an, an interview with Mary Edo at um, TBO, and I always remember this when she said to me, she said, Randy, is there a part of you that feels a little bit guilty about taking these horses out of their natural environment? environment? And I said, not really, because I said, had we not, these horses wouldn't be alive today. Yeah. I said, they, they maybe don't have a million acres to run on, but they've got a piece of security that they've never known in their lives. 
and they're 27 now, and I see them out here by the by the shed. They're just standing in the sun, and you know they no feeding times, and they just they just eat, sleep, and play now. Yeah. And to me, uh, you know that's it, it, it's a huge problem, and and uh, I know, like you said, it is was moving them out, but I, I just feel at least we tried to do our part as best we could. Well, you you guys did amazing. Uh, if if everybody were like you guys, there wouldn't be problems like this. But uh, well, well I, I think the only thing is, in all honesty, is these are dangerous horses, and they're they're not for everyone. I had people call me up, you know, kids, and they would say, "Oh, I want one this or this," and I just want to keep it in the barn. And a uh, barn, I mean, it's not that simple. These horses are wild, yeah. you know, and that's the problem. Like it's just not every facility can handle these and. And uh, the younger horses, yes. I mean, they're the, the yearlings and things that they will adapt to our methods, but or to our society. But the older fellows, they're the ones, and they will, as ours have. But it takes a lot of patience, time, and the right setup. Yeah. Um, what is the Mustang Magic performance? Yeah, it's the Mustang Magic is a little show we put together um, a couple of years ago, and we've done a few fairs with it, and, and I used it here at our place and it's uh we build it as spectacular film incredible horses wonderful story and we use cody and jackson our second generation or third generation or pictures of them there on the carriages and at the fairs and it was we go to the fair and, and we would set up and we'd take our carriage our harnesses and we would take we put a 20 minute clip of the film of the mustangs and we would take that and People could come and pet a real Mustang, get their picture taken with one, and watch them perform. And it, it was wonderful. You know, the people really enjoy it, and and they can come and visit the horses, look at our harness, look at the first Mustang carriage, and yeah, it's, that's pretty well what Mustang magic is. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And you still do those? Yes, we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I feel like we need to organize a bus load here from where I'm at. I'm in Kitchener, and I feel oh. like a lot of people here would be interested in coming out and seeing that. Oh, I'm sorry. When you say that, I don't do the shows here. I mean, we do travel with it a bit if, 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 if anyone cares to hire us. But, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, you would have, yeah, it's a shame that, that you didn't, I think the last uh, Mustang Fest we did was 13, I believe, I think was the last one. Oh, okay. But they were fun, you know, we have, it was great, we had all the people, it was always fun to see the people, and, and uh, you know, and over the years, too, I've had 4-H groups come in, and I've had one little girl did a school project, she sent me a, uh, a really lovely letter. Hi, Mr. Bird. I got a, I got an A in my project. <laughs> well, those are the kind of things I remember. That just the fun times and the people that would come and and two or three summers here, the, the county had a or fall they had a thing called Rural Ramble. We'd have a two day tour, and we get eight hundred thousand people. You know, and that was fun to see the families come and see real wild horses. And they were a lot quieter, but then no one was. <laughs> wow. Well, I also have a question. I found out you have an orphaned elephant. Oh, yes. That, 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 that's <laughs> that's a different uh, story altogether. Yeah, it, it really is. I think that's the, the third. Next to horses, my, my next greatest passion would be wildlife. And last year, my daughter and my wife were in uh, Kenya. And my, my daughter was with Western University over there on a project. She was there for three months. My wife, Joanne, she went over to visit her for two weeks. So in Nairobi, they have an elephant nursery there. There's a wildlife foundation has an, uh, an elephant nursery whereby they, some of these, or the, the mothers are poached or, you know, whatever. And so the babies are just, you know, wandering. So this little girl was, they spotted her for an, an aerial search. They spotted her wandering along in this park all by herself. And she's about 10 months old. And from the air, they could see a carcass about a mile down the road. They figured it was a mother who'd been poached. So mm -hmm. they, they brought her back to the nursery. And, uh, but uh, Rochelle was there and Joanne, and, and they um, were looking at her and they both said that they, um, this boy, we, and you could adopt these. They, they would like you to adopt them. So they said, well, we need to do this for dad. So I was, it was in May, I guess it was, I got this email from this foundation and just gave me all the story on, on this. We nicknamed her Metty, this little orphan elephant, just the cutest little thing. And with a history on it, where she was caught. And then when Rochelle came home a few weeks later, she bought me the, the whole, a complete folder on her with all her, you know, pictures and things. And so um, 
I just I get monthly updates on her and, and can watch her grow and her progress. And our, my goal, or my next big trip, I'd love to go to Africa and meet her. Yeah, that's uh, sounds amazing. And, and one of the reasons that, that, I, that when I studied it, 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 the thing that I found so fascinating was that it's so much similar to the Mustangs, animal human conflict, you know, loss of habitat, poaching. I mean, the Mustangs didn't have poaching the, the same as they do, but they're so similar. And I thought, wow. And these four little, you know, orphans wandering around. So anyhow, it, it just was so much like the Mustang project. And so I thoroughly enjoy getting my updates on her. And, and uh, we just sort of put a few on Facebook so people can see. And hmm. So that's what that's all about. Well, you're an extraordinary, extraordinary man, Randy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, I really appreciate your time, and I know the listeners are enjoying the, the pictures and and uh, the conversation. Um, do you have any parting words before we finish our conversation here? Uh, yes, I would. I, I think you know. I just like to say to all of the horse owners, my philosophy is that you will only get out of your horse what you or someone else put into them and you really shouldn't expect any more. There is no substitute for doing your homework. And I've never found a horse, but I've never met a horse yet that trained himself for one thing, and to my knowledge, there are no quick fixes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Patience is definitely the key in letting, letting uh, and putting in the work that way. I mean, a lot of people don't have that kind of patience. They want to see quick results and... Well, you know, yeah, uh, you may get results, but uh, whether they'll be last year or not, then that is the question. See? Yeah. I always believe that that horse, you know, and we have a policy here. We have a 60-day minimum. Usually it takes longer than that, but 60-day is a minimum. And uh, we say that if, in fact, we have started your horse, we've it's been through our program, I will take that horse back at any time for a shorter period for a refresher course. For instance, if it's a spring and they haven't ridden or driven, then we will take the horse back and, because I always know where to start and they never forget everything that they've learned here. It's that rock solid base that, that you put in them that, you know, usually they will retain some of for sure. I, I guess I want to ask you as well, you do clinics, do you train people as well? I mean, you have... Yeah, a we, if we're hired, we, we'll go and do clinics. I, you know, we, we've, we've done quite a few clinics, sure. We'll... Um, Yes, we, we, we do that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Randy. I, thank you so much. I mean, I'm just in awe. I want to go back on your website and uh, keep sharing your information out. I think everybody needs to know about you and the way that you are able to work with horses is uh, the well, better we have, way. We have a saying, you're just another day at the ranch, and this is just another day at the ranch. <laughs> right on. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Blue Sky Radio. Today we spoke with Randy Bird. You can find out more about Randy at Randy Bird Equine Education uh, online and also Blue Sky Radio broadcasts out of Radio Waterloo. You can find us online at radiowaterloo.ca. If you are in Kitchener and Waterloo, Ontario and Canada, you can find us on 102.7 FM. Blue Sky Radio broadcasts every Thursday at 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Blue Sky is advocacy radio that also does video podcasting, trying to raise awareness for horses and also people who are doing unique and extraordinary things in our communities. Hence why we spoke with Randy Bird, a.k.a. the Horse Whisperer today.